So now we've uh, looked at the different forms of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. Let's ha now have a look at how we can use their properties to practically use it uh, in industry and to assist us. Okay, so two major points for today. We're going to look at the uses of radioactivity and how the different properties of the radiations can lead to those uses and also describe the dangers of ionizing radiation. So one of the major uses of radiation, which you would have touched upon with your analysis of gamma rays in the previous unit, is medical uses. So radioisotopes have various medical uses, which we will go through in a little bit of detail later. And the choice of radioisotope is, isotope is based on two things, its half-life and the type of radiation it gives out. So your task is to research the following uses, using uh, the use of a radioactive tracer inside the body, use of gamma cameras to produce images, or the use of gamma radiation to destroy cancerous tumors. So what you should have discovered were looking at medical tracers. Radioactive tracers are used to investigate a patient's body without the need for surgery. That's the advantage of tracers. Here's an example here with the kidney, for example. You don't have to actually do surgery. You can put a tracer in and see what the um, normal kidney should look like and if there's any problems. So gamma emitters are usually used or beta emitters because obviously alpha particles can't get through the body, so your detector outside the body wouldn't be able to see any radiation. Okay, an example of a good isotope that's used is technetium-99 because it has a well a very short half-life because that means that it decays before it can do much damage in the body. Because you've also got, like, if you've got gamma radiation, you don't want gamma radiation to be floating around the body for very long. Okay, so it's short. Basically, you go into the doctor, he gives you the sample. Within the hour, he's got some readings, so it allows him to make some judgments. But it, but you don't want it to be emitting gamma radiation all the time. So 66 hours half life is sufficient to get this reading, but then to decay back into a stable isotope, which won't affect the rest of the body and cause things like cancer. Okay. Looking at a gamma camera, so the way it works is it let, lets radiologists um, look at the functioning of different parts of the bo uh, body's organ systems, like the thyroid, the heart, and the lungs. Okay, and this usually involves gamma emitting radioisotopes. And again, the reason why is because they can uh, leave the, through the organs, so you can detect it outside the body. And again, looking for a isotope with a reasonably short half-life, like technetium-99 for the same reasons as you would for testing, say, uh, the uh, efficacy of your kidneys. Okay, a gamma knife is used uh, for treating cancer, for example, and attacks the cancer but not the healthy uh, tissues around it. Okay, usually around small areas because gamma radiation is fatal to um, cancer cells or fast-growing mutating cells but not so much normal cells, which don't uh, grow that much, unlike the gametes, for example. Okay. So an example you would use is cobalt-60. Okay. Uh, it doesn't remain in the body anyway, because you're doing it from outside into the body, but it will be relatively stable. It won't decay before it is actually used. So an extension of the gamma knife is more invasive Radiotherapy, it's where you're using really high doses of radiation and you can focus on cancer cells inside the body so you can kill them directly, okay, outside or from inside the body by putting radioactive materials close to the tumour. And again, the kind of isotopes you're looking for are cobalt-60 for the same reasons as you would use it for the gamma knife. And one more is the example of radio implants, okay, usually a, a small radioactive source placed directly near the tumour, okay, so it hits it with a small uh, dose of gamma radiation over a long period of time, and it kills these tumour cells. Another uh, technique in medicine in which gamma radiation is used for is sterilisation, okay, so there's microorganisms all over our medical instruments, you need to kill them. The most effective way is through sterilization with gamma radiation. And that way you can actually 
kill the bacteria but, uh, while they're still in the packaging. So don't actually have to open up the syringe, for example, here on the image uh, without and, and therefore uh, expose it to other bacteria. You can do it inside the package and make sure it's really sterile. Okay, the lifetime of food can also be increased by the same process because you're killing the bacteria inside the food. Okay, so another practical application uh, outside of medicine is tracing leaks. Okay, so you can basically put a, uh, electronic tr a radioactive tracer through a fluid in a pipe. Okay, and when the leak occurs, you can basically use a geiger muller counter and see on the surface where there is the highest radiation. Now in terms of the uh, kind of uh, isotopes you want to use, you want to ones that are going to emit gamma radiation in order to go through the soil. Uh, in terms of industry again, looking at the automatic thickness of paper or uh, metal sheets, Okay, the amount of radiation received by the detector depends on the thickness of the paper in this particular example, or say the aluminium foil, if it's an aluminium foil company. And if the thickness increases, then the detector reading uh, falls because you're getting less of the radioactive source coming through. Okay, and this will cause the computer to bring the rollers closer together. So you can again squishing down the thickness of the paper or aluminium or metal of choice that you're using. In this particular case, the source should be a beta radiation source because uh, aluminium would not, or alpha particles wouldn't pass through the aluminium or the paper. Gamma rays would not be affected by any thickness of the change, so it'd be pointless using that. And a long half life must be used because you get a false thickness increase will be detected as the activity of the source would be decreasing. So if it's a short half life, you go, well, look, you're getting a reduction of emission of beta particles. So it must be that it's getting thicker. Well, it's not that. It could just be that the uh, isotope is decaying and therefore that's getting a reduced amount of beta emission. So you have a long half-life. And a good example is a strontium-90, a beta emitter with a half-life of around 30 years. Okay, smoke detectors, another example of using radiation. Okay, so essentially what happens is a radioactive source in the alarm ionizes the air gap around it, and so it conducts electricity, forming a, a charge, okay, so a basically electrical current, and in a fire, the smoke prevents the radiation causing ionization, okay, because the air gap's now full with particles, which stop the uh, radiation ionizing, it can't get through the particles, okay, and this drop of electrical current causes a set off the alarms. In this particular case, the source required should be alpha radiation. Um, this time, because remember it's slow moving, it's going to get uh, picked up by the, the smoke particles and stop, okay? Because it, if you use beta and gamma, uh, gamma radiation, it would not cause sufficient ionization or would not be affected by the smoke, and you should use a long half-life or a drop in current would set off the alarm again. So uh, a mirosenium at 241, an alpha emitter with a, a half-life of 433 years is usually used. Another uh, important application, at least in uh, history and archeology span is radiocarbon dating. Okay, so a living material uh, like a plant contains a certain, or even yourself contains a ratio of radiocarbon 14. Uh, the isotope are produced with high-speed high neutrons, parts of cosmic radiation uh, collide with nitrogen gas in our atmosphere, okay? And these are the equations, okay? Uh, you've got 14 nitrogen um, colliding with these high-speed neutrons to form 14 carbon and a proton. And this 14 carbon then decomposes by emitting a beta particle to form 14 nitrogen. Okay, so plants, for example, absorb carbon-14 during photosynthesis, and as all materials, living materials, contain a certain form of carbon-14 because of this, because we eat these plants. So when a, light, a plant or animal dies, it's no longer absorbing um, carbon-14 because it's no longer eating food, it's dead. Uh, therefore, the ratio of car radioactive carbon starts to decrease due to its half-life. Okay, and the age 
of the once living material can therefore be estimated by determining how much carbon-14 it's got left. And an example uh, in history where uh, radioactive dating is used is in the Shroud of Turin. Okay, so it should be about a thousand years um, according to the uh, analysis of the material which the Shroud is used in. Okay, suggesting it could be the Shroud of Jesus. However, there are certain uh, limitations which we'll look at in the next slide. Okay, the limitations are that the dating process assumes that the level of cosmic radiation reaching the Earth is constant. That this can be corrected by using objects of known age, okay, like the pharaohs and mummies, and that radiocarbon dating is limited to samples no older than 60,000 years, about 10 half-lives, because then it gets very hard to detect the uh, carbon-14 that's left, because it's quite small. Okay, so here's a radio dating question. So 360 grams of living wood has an activity of 72 bacchiel, okay, uh, and a 360 gram sample of wood from an archaeological site is found to have an activity of 9 uh, bacchiel. Estimate the age of the wood if carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,600 years. So pause the video now and let's see if you get the correct answer. Okay, so half of 72 is 36. Half of 36 is 18, and therefore half of 18 is 9. Okay, so we've got the activity of 9 bacchiel. Okay, so that means it would have gone, the wood would have gone under, undergone three half-lives, which is five times 5,600 years. So the age of the wood should be about 16,800 years. Okay, so dating rocks. There is a number of techniques that involve comparing the relative proportions of elements found in a rock sample. When, a rock, when formed, the rock may contain a isotope, which is radioactive, like uranium-238, which is called the parent nucleide, but over time, this decays down the beer thorium-234 into the stable isotope of lead-206, and these are called daughters, okay, from the parent. The older, rock, the ro older the rock sample, the greater will be the lead-206 content, because obviously there's less uh, uranium-238, because it's being converted into lead-206. So uranium dating is one of the methods we use to age the Earth. And that's kind of what we're doing. We're basically saying, well, we can work out the half-life of uranium-238, the associated half-life of the lead as well. And we can see the ratio of lead to uranium to work out the relative age, because if it's all lead, then it's going to be quite old, okay? because all the uranium has been converted into lead. Okay, so a non-porous sample of igneous rock contains three times as much argon-40 as potassium-40. Estimate the age of the rock, given that potassium-40 has a half-life of 1.25 billion years. And assuming that the rock was formed without any argon-40 around. Okay, so what you should have done, you should have worked out that after 1.25 billion years, there would be a 50-50 ratio of this potassium-40 to argon-40. Now, we've been told that we have uh, a 3 to 1 ratio, I believe, looking at the question. Yep, three times as much. So after 2 times 1.25 billion years, there would be a 25% potassium to 75% argon ratio, which is the current ratio we see in the rock. Therefore, the age should be 2.5 billion years, or 2 times 1.25 billion years, two half-lives. Okay. So in terms of all this radiation, what are the actual risks? Well, ionization can cause uh, damage to living cells, okay, causing cancer, okay, or genetic mutations. And alpha particles cause the greatest amount of ionization, hence they are the, potentially the most dangerous type of radiation, but because we've learned, they're e quite easy to stop because of their slow-moving nature. So our main concerns are beta and gamma radiation. Okay, so... Doses of radiation are measured in something called the millisieviert. Okay, so uh, basically your chest X-ray is about 0.1 millisieviert, whereas a lethal dose of radiation is about 4,000 uh, sieviert. Okay, quite a lot more than just your chest X-ray. Okay, and the millisieviert dose also allows for different effects of different ionization uh, radiation. Okay. 
So these are just uh, a range of radiation effects, what you'd experience. So at 0.1 millisevere is your chest x-ray and you wouldn't get any symptoms. Uh, multiply that by uh, 10,000. Uh, that's going to be a level at which high risk of cancer becomes noticeable, moderate risk. And then uh, about 100, uh, 10 times, 10 times, that would be your acute radiation sickness. So you can see that uh, chest x-ray is not that bad, uh, but by 10,000 millisivia, you're going to be dead. Okay, so that's kind of the higher range. That's the, the effect of radiation. And the way to reduce the risks are going to be uh, basically trying to reduce the amount of dose uh, as possible, like Homer Simpson's not doing. Okay, so you should basically store radioactive sources in a lead container to stop them emit uh, a gamma and beta radiation getting out. Uh, don't try and handle it as much as possible. Only handle with tongs, which I guess Homer is doing here. Uh, never point them at anyone, but never put them in your pockets or down your back. That will reduce the risk. Okay, and in terms of disposing of waste, um, so low level waste can easily be disposed by kind of uh, burning it. So the vapor goes into the air, that's low level waste, but nuclear waste is highly radioactive and it's at massive long half life. So it has to be stored for thousands of years. So what they do is they store it in giant underground caverns, okay, where it needs to be stored for that large amount of time. Uh, and these sites have to be uh, free of earthquakes or groundwater leakage. So examples would be, say, Australia, which doesn't have many earthquakes, so in the middle of the desert, under rocks there. Perfect place to, to store radioactive waste. And these are just a few questions which you could help uh, looking at applications of radioactivity questions. So these are kind of questions that you can do to assist with your understanding of the topic, which you can do in your own time and provide me with answers to make sure that you're showing your understanding of the topic.